James chapter 1, James the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered, greeting. My brethren, count it all a joy when you fall into different trials or testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh or produces patience or steadfast endurance. But let patience or endurance have its perfect or complete work in you, that you may be perfect and equipped, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let the brother of low degree, which is a reference to the poor man, let him rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, for because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withers the grass, the flower fails, and the grace and the fashion of it perisheth. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he or she is tried, they shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. The book of James has been called the epistle of applied Christianity. And I think that's my favorite title for the book of James, the epistle of applied Christianity. Christianity. James is Christianity 101. The book of James is asking us this morning, does your faith work? Is your Christianity real? I've met people that say, well, I, I tried Jesus, but it didn't work for me. It, it just didn't work. And my question is, then you probably don't have real faith because the theme of the book of James is faith that works. Or the idea that a real faith, a genuine faith, or an authentic faith, that it does produce works in our lives. So you might say that James is the book of applied Christianity. It's for those who are long on theory, but short on practice. And the first place that James says that our faith should work is in how we face trials, how we face testings how we face hardships, how we face difficulties. Someone said Christians are like tea bags. They, you don't really know what flavor they are until they're put in hot water. I like that. Yeah. You know, if you're a real Christian, let me see you through the fire. Let me see you in the heat. Let me see you face the difficult. What does Jesus Christ do in your life to help you through the hard times in life? And when I say hard times, let me tell you this. Whether you're a Christian or not, we all have hard times. You know, all the money in the world can't save you from trials. You can, get, you can be a billionaire and get sick and die. That's not, you, you, can't, you can't save yourself with your money. Everyone reaches a point where they need help outside themselves, and we have to trust in God. And as believers, we have not only the Lord to help us through life's difficulties, but we have the hope beyond the grave. Amen? We have hardships like any other man, but we have the help of God who is with us. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I can't imagine trying to live life without the hope of Jesus Christ in my heart. In the book of James chapter, or Job chapter 5, the Old Testament book of Job, verse 7, it says, man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upwards. And so we need to learn how to handle our hardships and our difficulties and our trials. And James is going to give us five things we need to be able to face trials and difficulties. But before we look at them, let's ask a few questions about this book of James. And the first one is in verse one, who is this James? Notice at verse one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I can make it very simple and get right to the point here. This James is actually a reference to the half brother of Jesus. And you go, well, what do you mean half brother of Jesus. After Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph got fully married. They culminated their relationship and they had other children. And so Jesus had stepbrothers 
and stepsisters. Now, they didn't believe in Jesus until after he was crucified and risen from the dead. And you can imagine how difficult it would be growing up in a home where the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God is your big brother. And you're constantly hearing, why can't you be like your big brother Jesus? He's always so perfect. I know, I know. I'm trying, you know. It's just crazy. And I can imagine one day when Jesus stood up and said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life that his brother, and mom, Jesus is flipping out. <laughs> but this is the James, who is the brother of our Lord and Savior. But he doesn't use that title. He uses the title servant. And the word servant in the Greek is the word doulos or bond slave. So he was the property of God. He, he belonged to God. He was a servant of God. He had no will of his own. He had devoted himself, and we should too, of being servants of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uses the full title for him. And he's writing to, who is he writing to? Verse 1, the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, and he gives them the normal greeting. Now, the 12 tribes which, by the way, are not lost. God knows who they are. But the fact that they are called scattered, it's the word diaspora. We get our word seed from it. And it indicates that they are Jews living outside the land of promise. They are not Jews who live in Palestine or in Canaan or the land of Israel, but they live outside the land, and they are of the diaspora, the dispersion. So they are persecuted for being Jews outside the land, and because they were also believers. And he gives them greeting. Now, James is writing early. It's believed that the book of James is one of the earliest epistles written. It's written about 41, 42 AD. And he's writing to tell them that if their faith is real and genuine, that it will be evidenced by the way they live. Now, throughout church history, a lot of people have not really liked the book of James. It's been kind of uh, rejected by some people because its emphasis is upon works. Paul's emphasis was on faith, and James is on works. Now, they don't contradict each other. We're saved by grace through faith, but a faith that saves is a faith that works. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It produces works. If someone says, I'm a Christian, but they have no works in their life to back it up, then I have to believe that they are not really a child of God. Now, to what degree, to what amount, that's in the hands of God. Some people grow quicker, some people grow slower, but there's got to be some evidence and some change of new life. A Christian is a person who has the life of God in their soul. You know, when the Bible says that we have eternal life, eternal life is the life of God in our soul. If we are a Christian, God actually lives in us. And we actually have the life of God in us. It's amazing to think about. So how can you go through life with God in you and it not be manifested out through you? So James tells us five things that we need to do when we face trials or troubles or hardships, or difficulties as Christians in this dark world. The first thing we need to do is have a joyful attitude. Yes, you heard me right. We need to have a joyful attitude. Now, there's going to be five key words, by the way, I want you to note in each of one of these points. And the first word is count. That's the key word. Notice verse 2. My brethren, it's writing to believers, count it all joy when, not if, but when, you fall into different trials and testings. Now, you might be saying, well, John, my Bible says temptations there. And my King James translation renders that temptations. But the word temptation and the word trial mean different things depending upon the contents, context. Now, when you get down to verse 13, and this will be my message next Sunday, we'll be talking about temptation. And that's when he begins to talk about a solicitation to evil. But in this section, verses 1 to 12, he's talking about trials or testings. We read, lead me not into temptation in the Lord's Prayer. Big stink about the Pope changing the Lord's Prayer. And it wasn't really changing the Lord's Prayer. There's already a lot of translations that render it that way. Lead me not into testings 
or trials. Because many times as we go into a testing or a trial, Satan will capitalize on that and he will tempt us. So temptations and trials go hand in hand. And they're the first two topics in James chapter 1. So we're tried and tested by God to bring out our worth. And then we're tempted by Satan to bring out our worst. And when I'm in a trial, I'm in a dangerous time in my life because then Satan comes along and tempts me to disobey. Tempts me to doubt God. Tempts me to turn away from God rather than trust Him and obey Him in every aspect of my life. But I wanted to point that out in verse 2, that the word should be rendered there, trials or testings. And notice he says, not if you fall into them, but when you fall into them. It's part and parcel of the Christian life. You cannot be a Christian and not go through difficulty. Because it's the, one of the chief ways that God uses it in our life to produce maturity and to equip us for ministry and service. Notice that the trials differ. In verse 2, he uses the word diverse or different. There's physical trials. There's financial trials. There's spiritual trials. There's emotional trials. There's different trials in relationships with people. There's trials of persecution. There's trials of finances and relationships. And they come in all shapes and all forms. And by the way, the older you get, more often your trials are physical, right? <laughs> you get together with your friends and it's like an organ recital. You talk about everything in your body that doesn't work anymore. I mean, that has hit me so hard lately. I'm with my friends, and we're all talking about what's going wrong with our bodies. I go, you know what? We are full-on old people right now. <laughs> Official buzzards, you know. When that's what we do is talk about it doesn't work right anymore. And the older you get, the more trials your body brings you. But God is gracious, is not He? Is not the Lord with us and promised to be our help and our strength? So what do we do when we go through different trials and difficulties? Verse 2, count it all joy. Now, I know some of you are saying, now please tell me that's not what it means in the Greek right now. There's got to be something a little deeper in there to indicate that that's not really what it's saying, is it? No, that's really what it's saying. Count it all a joy. It's talking about a joyful attitude even in our sorrows and in our suffering. Now, this is something that the believer has that the non-Christian does not have. The non-Christian has all their eggs in one basket, and that's this life. And things better go smooth because this is all you get. Get all the gusto, get all you can, can all you get, because this is it. And if something goes wrong, then you lose everything. But for the Christian, we have the hope of heaven beyond this life. We have heaven now in our soul, and we have heaven to look forward to one day. So we can actually rejoice. Joy is that fountain well of springing up within my soul that even though I'm going through difficulty and sorrow or someone I love has died and my heart is broken and I'm grieving, the Bible says we sorrow not as others who have no hope. I love that. For if we know Jesus died and rose again, even so those who have fallen asleep or died in Jesus, God's going to bring with him. There's so many people that I can't wait to see when I get to heaven. And I'm going to see them. And we're going to be together. And it's going to be wonderful. And it's a blessing to know that we have that blessed hope. So we can rejoice. Now, by the way, this is a command. James is famous in his epistle. There are, in the book of James, 108 verses. And of those 108 verses, 58 commands or imperatives are found in this book of James. It's very straightforward and very to the point. And the first key word, as I've mentioned, is the word count. It's a financial term. It means to evaluate or what we value. It's all about your values. Your values determine your evaluations. If you value comfort over character, then your trials will upset you. If you value character over comfort, then Lord, have your way. Do with me as you want to. Make me what you want me to be. Jesus put it like this. He said, when you're reviled and persecuted for righteousness' sake, Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be 
exceedingly glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. And we get to there in verse 12. And I, it's hard for me not to get ahead of myself because the, my favorite is verse 12, the end of this section. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to all those who love him. That's what the end is. So the end game, when the outlook is bad, we try the uplook, we keep our focus upon heaven. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul said that we glory as Christians in tribulation. You go, well, you know, that's all fine and dandy, but I, I really find that very difficult. So what we need is the second thing, and that is in verse 3, we need to have an understanding mind. This is how I am able to rejoice in my sorrows and suffering. Verse 3, look at it with me. Knowing something, that's the key word. Key word in verse 2 is count. Key word in verse 3 is knowing. Knowing this, that the trying of my faith works what? Patience. Some of you don't want to read that word because you don't like that word. The minute you hear the word patience, you get all bummed out. We want everything fast. Turn the computer on, boom, it comes on before you even touch the button. Just think computer on, boom, it comes on. The other day I went into an in and out and a, and a church bus just showed up before I did. <laughs> and I was so hungry, I was like about ready to die. I'm like, I felt like Esau, you know, please, just one pot, you know. And I went to the front of the line, I'm talking to these kids. I, I, I almost said, I'm a pastor, can I take cuts? Praise God, I didn't do that. But I almost did. I was like, man, I'm a man of God. Let me in here. I want to eat. I need food right now. I had to get in my car and drive somewhere else. I won't tell you where I went, but I went somewhere else. But we're tested and we're tried. I don't know how I got to that point. I've lost my spot right now. I'm an in and out trying to get a hamburger, and I don't know where I am in the text. Lord, help me. Patience. Patience, there it is, right there. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you get old. <laughs> patience. You know what the word patience means? It's not a passive concept. It's a positive concept. It means steadfast endurance. Now, it, it would actually be used of a person that's in a strong wind and he's leaning into the wind and pressing forward. We think of patience as just standing when the wind's blowing hard, but patience is actually progress, leaning into the wind when the wind is blowing. So it means steadfast endurance. So this is how I can rejoice. I know that God is producing steadfast endurance. Now, I need to know two things, and I want to make them clear from the text, verse 3. I need to know that my trials are designed by God, and I use that word designed, important, to test my faith. Notice verse 3 says, the trying of your faith. That which is being tried and tested is your faith. It's like being put to the test. So you find some gold or iron ore, you take it to the assessor, and they run tests on it to determine if it's genuine, if it's authentic. You might find gold in them their hills and say, I've got gold. How do you know? Has it been tested? Has it been proven? You say, I have faith. How do you know? Is it genuine? Someone said, a faith that cannot be trusted or tested cannot be trusted. I think of Abraham, whose faith was tested in Genesis 22. God actually told him to offer his son on a mountain. You talk about a trial or a testing. God, you want me to do what? You want me to offer my son on an altar? But the next morning, Abraham rose up in obedience, saddled the donkey, and took Isaac, and journeyed to the land of Moriah. And as they were going up the mountain, Isaac said, Father, here's the, here's the wood, and here's the fire, and here's the knife, but where's the sacrifice? Can you imagine how Abraham's heart was breaking? He was being tested and tried by God. And he said to his son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Isaac lay on the altar and he lifts his hands to plunge it into his son. And God stops Abraham and said, now I know that you love me and that you will obey me. 
And he looked over in the bushes and there was a ram caught and he took the ram and he substituted for Isaac. Picture of how Jesus died in our place. And he substituted the ram there. But the testing of his faith to prove that he loved God more than even his own son, knowing that God, if he had to, would raise his son from the dead, even as Jesus died and rose again for us. But notice, secondly, that my trials will make me strong. So number one, they're testing the value and the reality of my faith. And then secondly, they're given to make me strong. Verse three, works patience or steadfast endurance. Trials are for our good and for God's glory to prove our faith and produce patient endurance. So number one, we need to count it a joy. Number two, we need to know that God's producing steadfast endurance in my life. And here's number three, it's in verse four. We need to have a surrendered will to God. And if we don't do this, it can circumvent God's purpose and plan for the trial in our life. This is so important, verse four. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature, entire or equipped, lacking in nothing. Now the key word here in verse four is the word let. So you have count, verse two, knowing, verse three, and then let. You have to surrender your will. The great danger when we face trials is that we resist God. And we don't allow Him to work in our life. You need to let God have His way. You know, the Bible metaphorically pictures God as a potter, and we are on the wheel, and we are what? Clay. I am the potter, thou art the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. I love that song. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Filled with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. He is the potter and we are the clay. When I was in high school, I had an arts and crafts class and I'm a bit of an artist, but I've never been able to throw a pot, pot on the wheel. Never. The minute I get the clay set on the wheel, the minute the wheel starts to turn, everything's fine until I touch it. <laughs> the minute I touch it, it goes, bloop, 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 flies off. I, I can never get it right. It just bloop, bloop, flies off. So I've always just kind of put two grooves in it, you know, hit it on the wall, put a couple of grooves made an ashtray every time. <laughs> My mom got more ashtrays that year and she didn't smoke. Here, mom has another ashtray. Aren't you glad that I'm not the potter? You'd all be ashtrays right now. <laughs> but God is the master potter and as you look closely at his hands, they're scarred because he loves the clay. He gave his life for that clay. And the circumstances are the wheels of our life and they're turning and God knows how to speed things up or slow things up. He knows the pressure he has to apply. He knows just how to develop that pottery. Many times there's pain and there's difficulty, but we need to stay pliable and yielded, living by faith and trust in God. Now what happens if we surrender to God? Two things. Verse 4, we will grow up. That's what it means when it says that you may be perfect. In other words, you will grow up. You'll be mature. There's no shortcuts to maturity. You have to be tried and tested. It's like ripe fruit. You'll grow to maturity. And then secondly, you will be equipped to help others. And this is so important to understand. If you want to be used by God, if you want your life to be a blessing to others, Verse 4 says that you will be entire or equipped, lacking or deficient in nothing. You know what it's saying? It's saying that not only will you grow up, but you will be used by God to be a blessing and an encouragement and a help to other people. I believe with all my heart because of two things. Number one, the Bible teaches it. And number two, life has proven it to me that God equips us for service through suffering. If you want to be used by God, you can't find it all in a textbook. 
You're not going to get it all in a classroom or a Bible college or seminary. You're going to get it in the school of hard knocks. To be able to have a sympathetic heart, to be able to understand people's sorrows and identify with it, to be able to encourage people in hardship and difficult times, you must also know what it is to suffer. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of years past, he said, God gets his best soldiers from the highlands of affliction. I was thinking about this the other day. We have a son that just got out of army boot camp, and he just started a military school for learning languages. And I've never experienced it in my whole life, being an army dad or having a son that's in the military. And now I understand when I see military, my heart goes out to them because it's like, you know, that, that, that's your son, that's your daughter, that's your child. I have a lot more compassion for him. But, you know, Though he's classified a soldier now, he's not been in any warfare. You don't know what kind of a soldier you are until you're in war, right? It's, you're not really a soldier until you've been in a war situation. And then it's proven what kind of character you have. So God equips us so that we might serve others and be a blessing to others. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan desires to have you so that he could sift you like wheat. He wants to sift you like wheat. But Peter, I've prayed for you. Can you imagine Jesus turning to you and saying, hey, Satan called me last night. He asked for you by name. Like, whoa, what'd you tell him, Lord? Tell him to bug off Beelzebub? Satan calls God. You know that John Miller dude? I want him. He said, but I prayed for you and when you have been tested and tried and you are converted, strengthen your brothers. So he wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter after he fell on his face and denied the Lord, wept tears bitterly, and God brought him back and restored him. And then he wrote those epistles to encourage us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, there's a whole section in that chapter where it talks about God allows us to go through suffering so that we can encourage other people who are suffering. I, I've been a pastor for many, many years now. And I remember when I was a young pastor and I would do marriage counseling or I would counsel people with children. I didn't have any children. Or I'd do a funeral and nobody I loved had ever died. And it's taken all these years for God to ripen me and to mature me, to be able to experience all these things in life so that I can minister out of not only theory, but from a heart of experience. So God is making you. He's not made you. He's making you, and God has a ministry for you to do, and it may be that you're still in school. You haven't even graduated yet. God was going to open that door. Moses was 80 years old. I just thought I'd share that with you to encourage you when God called him into full-time ministry. You never know what God's plans and purposes are. So God uses us by suffering. But let me give you the fourth thing you need when you face trials. And uh, that is in verses 5 to 8, and that is a prayerful heart. So you need to have a joyful attitude. You need to have a knowing, understanding mind. You need to have a surrendered will. And then verse 5 to 8, you need to have a prayerful heart. Nothing's more important than learning how to pray when you pass through trials. Notice verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask or pray to God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But you need to ask in faith, nothing wavering, for if you're not asking in faith, you're wavering. You're like the waves of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord, for a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Now, what is one of the things we need most when we're going through a trial? The answer, wisdom. Isn't what we say when things go wrong? Why? Why, God? What are you doing? What are you trying to teach me? Well, why did this happen to me, Lord? What do you want me to learn? So we need wisdom from God. That's what we need. Paul was going through a time of testing and trial in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He had a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And three times Paul asked God, prayed, and asked God to do what? 
Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. God, I want to escape my sorrows. Isn't that what we do? Lord, heal me. Take away the pain. Lord, provide for me. Take away the difficulty. Lord, work this problem out. So we pray to escape our sorrows. But God told Paul, no, I won't take it away, but I'll give you my grace, and my grace will be sufficient for you. My grace will make you strong. It it will be your strength and your weakness. So we need to pray for wisdom. God, help me to enlist, not escape my sorrows. Let me give you some ideas of things you can pray for. Pray that God would use you or teach you what He wants you to learn. Don't pray to escape, but pray that God will teach you, give you wisdom. Secondly, you can pray that God will make you humble. That's a good thing. Humility is a good thing. The proud God knows afar off. The humble God knows close. He he is nigh to those who have a broken heart. Ask God to humble you as well as teach you. And thirdly, ask God to wean you from the world. You know, as Christians, sometimes we get too tied to the world. We get too drawn to the world. And you know what will wean you from the world? Having the world taken away from you. Loss of a job. Loss of a loved one. Loss of your health. Nothing will will wean you more from the world faster than, than to have it taken away but it's a blessing in disguise. God's trying to teach you the value of spiritual things. James gives us four encouragements to pray, and I want you to see them in verse 5. First encouragement is that God gives to all. He says in verse 5 that He giveth to all. Secondly, God gives liberally. Verse 5, He gives liberally and generously. So God is good, and God is generous. And then thirdly, don't be hesitant to pray because God will not upbraid you or reproach you. You ever gone to ask somebody for something and they go, well, I've already helped you before. And what, you know, what'd you do with what I gave you before? And, you know, I'm sick and tired of helping you out. Okay, well, I won't ask you anymore. Aren't you glad God doesn't do that? Lord, I need help. I'm sick of you. <laughs> Didn't you ask for help last week? Yeah, but Lord, I'm short this month and I need some money to pay the mortgage. I already helped you pay your mortgage. What's your problem? Aren't you glad God doesn't deal with us like that? And he's like, okay, sorry, God. I won't bug you anymore. God doesn't only give to everyone. God doesn't only give liberally, but he doesn't chide us or abrade us. And then fourthly, verse 5, God will answer. God will answer. It says in verse 5, and it shall be given him. It shall be given him. That's a promise that God will answer your prayers. Jesus said it like this, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open to you. John Newton, the man that wrote the famous song, Amazing Grace, wrote these words, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions would thee bring. For his grace and power are such that none could ever ask too much. I love that. So when you come to God, bring your petitions. Bring large petitions. Because you can't ask too much. God is liberal and generous, and he answers prayer. But James tells us that when we pray, verse 6 to 8, that we need to pray with a believing heart, not in unbelief, but faith. We don't want to be like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. So important that we are committed to believing that God is, that He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. But there's the fifth and last thing we need when we face the trials of life. And it's in verses 9 to 12. We need to count it all a joy. We need to know that God's working it for my good. We need to let God have His perfect way in me to mature me. And then fifthly, or fourthly, we need to ask God through prayer for wisdom to use it wisely. And then fifthly, verse 9 to verse 12, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. Let the brother of low degree. Now that's a reference to the poor person. Some of you go, amen, that's me in the Bible. I claim that. I'm the poor guy. 
then you need to rejoice. Why? Because God exalts you. In other words, you may be financially or monetarily poor, but guess what? If you're a Christian, you're a child of the king, amen? And you have treasures untold, and you're going to heaven. I, I, there's an old hymn that talks about, I'm a child of the king, I'm a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. And it talks about heaven, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? He's building a palace for me over there. Of rubies and diamonds and emeralds and gold, his coffers are full, he has riches untold. I'm a child of the king. It doesn't matter what's happening around you right now, you are rich in God through Jesus Christ. And so he takes the low man and he lifts him up. But the rich man, verse 10, he is made low. So you rejoice that if you're poor, God exalts you, and if you're rich, God makes you low. And he's actually saying that. If you've got money and wealth and you're well taken care of, thank God if he does something to humble you and to bring you down, to make you more dependent on him, and that you understand the value of spiritual things. Because why? Because as a flower of the grass, he shall pass away. You know, all your money can't save you. All your money can't save you from the hand of the grave. It's appointed unto every man once to die, and after this, the judgment. I don't care how rich you are, you get sick like the poor man. You die like the poor man. Death is the great equalizer. Rich and poor die alike. The question is, where do you go when you die? Where will you spend eternity? And that is answered in verse 12. The Christian has blessed is the man that endures temptation or trials or testings. For when he is tried, he shall receive what? Crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that, what? Love him. There's the last key word. Love. Count, know, let, ask, love. Do you love God? Do you love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength? You know what trials often do, and this is a good thing? Trials often show us what we really love the most. If you're whining and complaining about something that's happened to you and you're all upset, maybe it's because you love that more than God. The Bible says that we're to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. On those two things hang all the law and the prophets. You know, that if you love God supremely, nothing much can go wrong with you. God will take care of you. That's the most important thing. In every area of your life, if you just make your love for God to be supreme, and obedience to God, and faith in God, and trust in God, and hope in God, and longing for God, and God becomes your all in all, you're in good shape. God will take care of you. But the thing that it's saying, and I love it in verse 12, I don't want to complicate this. I want to make it as simple as I can. This is one of those passages that, Lord, I I, I don't want to fog up this this passage. I, I I don't want to cloud it up. James is saying, you're going to heaven. You're going to have the crown of life. You go, well, isn't that pie in the sky and the sweet by and by? Yes. And praise God for that. Because I plan on eating that pie. I plan on enjoying my pie in heaven. It's a crown of glory. It's a crown of life. It's a crown of rejoicing. And I plan on hearing those words one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And at that moment, all the sorrow and the suffering and the hardship and the difficulty and the pain and the heartache is going to be gone and wiped away. There'll be no more tears. He'll wipe away the tears from her. There'll be no sorrow, no crying, no sin. No sickness, no sadness. It's the land of no more. Satan will be bound. He'll be banished. And we'll be in the presence of the Lord. Heaven is a wonderful place. And we're going to go there someday. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to heaven. But until that day, we need to live here on earth. 
There's nothing wrong with hoping for heaven and longing for heaven and anticipating heaven. But here's the sad thing. If you're not a Christian this morning, you don't have that hope. All you have is this life. All you can do is cross your finger and hang on to your rabbit's foot. And bless your lucky stars. And hope that everything goes smooth because this is all you have here and now. But if you're a Christian, you have heaven in your soul right now. You have joy in the midst of even sorrow and suffering. And you have hope beyond the grave. It's all because Jesus Christ came from heaven, died upon the cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead. And he's gone back to heaven, and one day he's going to take us there. He said, I've gone to prepare you a place, and if I go to prepare you a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Every year that passes means we're only a year closer to going to heaven and being with the Lord. Amen? My question this morning is, do you have that hope of heaven? Are you a Christian? Have you been born again? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Do you know that if you died right now that you would go to heaven? The Bible says all, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's no one righteous. No one. We're separated from God. Our sins have separated us from God. And that's the reason Jesus came from heaven, died on the cross to pay for our sins. And he rose again from the dead. Now, if you will trust him, he will save you, give you heaven in your heart, and take you to heaven someday when you die. And if you're here right now, listening to these words, and you don't know beyond any doubt that if you died, you'd go to heaven, I want to give you an opportunity right now, right here, to trust Jesus Christ and invite him into your heart. And let him forgive your sins. You can leave here today with the hope of heaven in your heart. By saying, Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me and make me your child. If God has spoken to you through this message today and you're not sure that you're a child of God, maybe you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would go to heaven. You've never really trusted Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, I would like to lead you in a prayer right now, inviting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Savior. So as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it out loud, right where you are, after me. Make it from your heart, inviting Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I pray that you'll forgive me and come into my heart and make me your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe in you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God heard that prayer, and I believe that God will and does forgive your sins. We'd like to help you get started growing in your walk and relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. If you just prayed with Pastor John to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are so excited for you. And we'd like to send you a Bible and some resources to get you started in your relationship with the Lord. Simply click on the contact link at the top of the page and tell us something like, I prayed to accept Christ. We'll get your Bible and resources mailed out to you right away. God bless you and welcome to the family of God.